Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first ever episode of what I'm temporarily calling Math with Kyle, and happy Pi Day to all of you. While this video will probably be up on 315, that's just Pi rounded up rather than down. And if New Year's etiquette is anything to go by, I believe it's still appropriate to wish people well for up to a week afterwards. Here are the goals with this video. I'll talk briefly about the history of computing Pi to ever more impressive precision, up to the point where John Machen discovered his 1706 trigonometric formula, which gives Pi in terms of arctangents in such a way that computation is swift. Swift enough that he was able to compute Pi to 100 decimal places all by himself. Then we'll talk about how to use his formula to set up a Pi calculation to 10 decimal places, and for this we'll review some of the theory of alternating series. Lastly, we'll actually go ahead and compute pi to those 10 decimal places. Well, to be more accurate, 9 will look correct, but we'll indeed get in an approximation that's correct to 5 parts per 100 billion. What I like about this topic is that it takes a transcendental number, pi, and makes it feel like something much more concrete. Sure, it's the ratio of the circumference of a circle to its diameter, but, you know, what is it equal to in a form that looks like an everyday decimal number? We're at least aware that the digits are something people memorize, but where do they come from? Now, some of you Tade adherents might scoff at celebrating the constant that is merely half the circumference of a unit circle, but can't we all come together and agree that having two days of mathematical celebration per year is better than one? Anyway, let's move on to some history. The history of pi is much too expansive to condense into something short and coherent. I highly recommend taking a look at Peter Beckman's A History of Pi, where he gives a compelling story of our collective mathematical development reflected through our ability to grapple with measuring and understanding the perimeters of circles. While knowing hundreds, thousands, or millions of digits doesn't do much to progress human understanding, for example, you only need 22 digits to get the circumference of a perfectly spherical Earth to within one electron radius, it's nevertheless illuminating to see how breakthroughs in digit calculation followed from breakthroughs in mathematics. The earliest methods seem to have been empirical. Draw a circle, measure its circumference and diameter, then divide. Antiquity knew the values 3, 3 and 1 8, and 3 and 1 7 as estimates. A big breakthrough was from Archimedes of Syracuse around 250 BC. He constructs approximations for pi by inscribing and circumscribing regular polygons and calculating their perimeters, giving lower and upper bounds for the constant. With a 96 gone, he manages to estimate that pi is between 3 and 10 71sts and 3 and 1 7th. As a modern decimal approximation, he found that pi is about 3.14. In principle, his method extends to arbitrary precision, given exponential levels of perseverance and commitment. For example, Vieta in the 1590s eked out nine decimal places with the Archimedean method, using polygons of 393,216 sides. We do not have these two qualities, so let's look onward. James Gregory, a Scottish mathematician from the mid-1600s, worked out some interesting integrals and power series in the era just before the discovery of differential and integral calculus. He found that the area under the curve, y equals the reciprocal of 1 plus x squared on the interval 0 through t, was equal to arc tan of t. Long division of this rational function yields a series representation, and using Cavalieri's formula, which every calculus student is familiar with, if not its name, we get a series for the arctan function, which was independently discovered by Leibniz a few years later. The interest here is that the arctangent of 1 is pi over 4, hence the formula that pi is 4 times the alternating sum of reciprocals of the positive odd integers. Unfortunately, the Gregory-Leibniz series converges much too slowly to be useful for calculation. Even three decimal places needs 2,000 terms. During the plague years of 1665 through 1666, Newton came up with the theory of calculus and infinite series. In one account of his discovery, at least according to history books, which apparently diverge from his original work, he found that arc sine can be represented as an integral. Using his binomial theorem, he could write the integrand as an infinite series. Then, term-by-term -term integration, by Cavalieri's formula, gives an infinite series for arc sine. Since arc sine of 1 half is pi over 6, we have a series for pi. This series converges quickly due to the powers of 2 in the denominators, which make it converge at least as quickly as a geometric series, which is to say, practical for the computation of pi. 
six terms easily gives four digits. Amusingly, Newton, in his Method of Fluxions and Infinite Series, devotes four lines to calculating pi, apologizing for the triviality, and then gives pi to 16 decimal places. As he wrote in a letter, I am ashamed to tell you to how many figures I carried these computations, having no other business at the time. While the series converges relatively quickly, there is a way to take Gregory's approach and modify it to converge much more quickly than even this. John Machen was a professor of astronomy in London, and in 1706 he used the following trigonometric identities to set up a formula that would let him calculate pi to 100 decimal places. The workhorse here is the angle sum and difference identities for the tangent function. Let beta be arctan of 1 fifth. Then we can calculate the tangent of 2 beta and the tangent of 4 beta. With these, we can calculate the tangent of the difference of 4 beta and pi over 4. Hence, by taking the arctangent of both sides of this formula, we obtain the Machen formula for pi. The utility of this formula is that we can calculate each arctan using the Gregory series, whose convergence accelerates the closer the arguments to the functions get to zero. Both of these series converge relatively quickly. 71 terms of the first and 21 terms of the second are sufficient to calculate pi to Machen's 100 places. Now it's time to determine how many terms of each series we need to compute 10 digits of pi. Notice that in both series, the terms alternate positive and negative. These are called alternating series. A nice thing about an alternating series whose terms absolute values monotonically tend to zero is that, since each additional term is a correction going the other way from the previous term, you can easily determine how close a partial sum is to the true value of the series. The true value is that partial sum plus or minus the value of the next term. So we aim to calculate 10 digits. There are certain complexities to what it means to calculate 10 digits. The interpretation we are going to take is that this means we want to know the true value of pi to within 5 times 10 to the minus 11. That is to say, the approximation will be within an interval centered at pi whose width is 10 to the minus 10. This doesn't mean that the 10 digits after the decimal point will be literally correct, however, since rounding might cause the last digit to be off by one, so to speak. There are two series involved, one for 16 arctan of 1 5th and one for 4 arctan of 1 2 39th. We need to decide how we will allocate the allowable error to each of these out of our budget of 5 times 10 to the minus 11. Since the second series will converge much faster due to all those powers of 239 in the denominators, I decided that we'll calculate the first series to within 4 times 10 to the minus 11, and the second to within 10 to the minus 11. The first order of business, then, is to figure out how many terms we should calculate for 16 arctan of 1 fifth. The absolute value of the nth term of this series has the given closed form. We would like to know when this becomes less than the error budget of 4 times 10 to the minus 11, which can be rendered as an inequality. In an attempt to solve this, we bring all the n's to one side, but this is not an easy inequality to solve in an inexact way. However, by constructing a table, one may compute that n equals 8 is the smallest solution to this inequality. Hence, the eighth term of the series for 16 arctan of 1 fifth has absolute value less than 4 times 10 to the minus 11, and therefore seven terms are sufficient to approximate the arctan to within that error budget. We may construct a similar inequality for 4 arctan of 1 2 39th, given its 10 to the minus 11 error budget. By similar considerations, we may find n equals 3 is the smallest solution to the inequality, hence two terms gives a sufficient approximation. Given our analysis, we have the following estimate for pi, and this is good to 10 decimal places. To save some calculation work, we can factor it as follows. This is a generally useful approach for evaluating polynomials to avoid having to take powers. Something else we can do to save some work is that dividing by 25 is the same as multiplying by 4 and then dividing by 100. We can also calculate some of these deeper terms with fewer digits of precision, since they're just going to be divided by 25 anyway. Being conservative, each layer in needs to be calculated to one fewer digit of precision, starting with 11 digits. So let's get to it. The actual calculation took me about 35 minutes, and since that would make for a rather long video, I've sped this up by 18-fold. I first write down the calculation that I'm about to do, and then I annotate it with how many digits of precision I should calculate for each part. I make a small mistake here, but I correct it later on. 
The first calculation is 4 thirteenths by long division. This is subtracted from 1 eleventh and then multiplied by 4. Many of these reciprocals, such as 1 ninth, are ones that I've memorized already. From this, we subtract the previous result and again multiply by 4. Then again with 1 seventh. one-fifth, then one-third, then we subtract this from one, and then multiply by four-fifths, which is 0 0.8. This is four times the arctangent of one-fifth. At this point, we construct a table of all the multiples of 239. I go out to the tenth multiple just to ensure I have computed it correctly. Then it's 1 third divided by 239, which is then divided by 239 again. And it is at this point that I realized that the number of digits I had intended to compute was one fewer than needed. This is then subtracted from 1 and then divided by 239 again. This yields the arctan of 1 over 239, which is then subtracted from 4 times the arctan of 1 third. And this difference is multiplied by 4 to yield pi to the required 10 digits. And so, after 35 minutes of labor, the calculation is completed. And there you have it, pi to 10 decimal places, how it was done, and a little history. Now, this is something that, after less than a minute of typing, a digital computer will happily compute instantly, even for a hundred times more digits. But I think there is still something to be gained from a little period reenactment, maybe if only to remind ourselves from what tedium or technological development can save us, beyond its wonderful ability to serve cat images on demand, of course. I hope you got something from this, and once again, happy Pi Day, everyone!